What is up, everybody? Welcome back to an all-new episode of the Pack-A-Day Podcast. I'm your host, Andy Herman. You can follow me on Twitter at Andy Herman NFL. I am super geeked out about this episode today because, as I was just telling my good friends, Perry Goldstein and Dusty Evely, I feel like sometimes we get super deep into the weeds this time of year with draft stuff. And sometimes you just need to have a really fun Packers conversation with your friends. So I could not be more thrilled than to be doing that today. So joining me, of course, is Perry Goldstein and Dusty Evely. You can find them both at Perry underscore Goldstein, right? I think. And then at Dusty Evely, I believe, because I did my research and checked it both. But (laughs) that is both of them. So uh, Perry, Dusty, welcome back. How the heck are you guys doing? This is so fun. My people. (laughs) What's up? <laughs> I know I've been out of the podcasting game for a couple of weeks and I missed that a little bit, but I also miss you guys so much. So I'm very excited to just talk ball for a little bit tonight. I am excited as well. Uh, so we're just going to go kind of through a variety of different topics. Obviously, we're a week and a half ish away from the draft and everything will change. They're going to draft a variety of different players at a variety of different positions. Then we all get to unwrap those presents and go into deep dives on those players. That's all going to be fun and exciting, but I figured we'll make it fun, conversational and easy going today and just have some sort of, you know, top of the uh, top of the mind discussions on where Green Bay could go, what they should do, what they shouldn't do and those sort of things. So with that being said, Perry, who is the 941st person on your big board? And specifically, <laughs> uh, all right, let's actually start with draft crushes because I think we all have some form of draft crush. And it's not fun going into the draft if you don't have a draft crush so you can have your heart broken every single year. Uh, so, Dusty, I'm going to let you do the honors this time. Who is your draft crush in this draft? And it could be a player or could you, whatever, whatever direction you want to go in here. What are you really hoping that the Packers do? Uh, to the shock of no one, offensive skill position, um, Jalen Wright out of Tennessee. That dude, lighting in a bottle, dude. I live in SEC country, so I've watched him quite a bit over the years. He's just just kind of a smallish, what's he, like 5'10", a little over 200 pounds, I think is what he weighed in at. I'd like a threat to take the ball the distance every time he touches. Just spark plug guy. With Jones out, and Jones never had that top end speed, but with kind of bigger backfield now of Jacobs and Dylan. Jacobs has some speed, but I want a guy like that little. I've always, I've just always loved like those little skitterbug backs. Yeah. Wright can just do so much damage in there. I think it's his hands could be better. I would love like a receiving guy, just send him up the seam. I don't know if he's quite there at least yet, but just watching that every time the ball is on his hands, like he could go the distance. So I, I, I've got a handful of ways I could go, but if they want Jalen Wright, like that's, that's my dude, man. It was Tajay Spears last year for like the exact same reasons. <laughs> I, I think um, one of the things I'm always bummed sometimes with Green Bay is that they don't always have those different flavors of running yeah. backs. And I would love just that, like you said, the little jitterbug that's just going all around the field. And like the, it doesn't have to necessarily be the Darren Sproles where he's that small and tiny, but just those guys that can do a little bit of everything out of the backfield. And you look at it where it's at right now with Josh, a- Josh Jacobs being sort of your do everything guy. You've got Dylan as a little bit more of your power guy. Emmanuel Wilson, we'll see what he can do in year two, but they don't have that flavor of running back. And mm-hmm you really look at their offense as a whole, they have kind of flavors of almost everything except that one thing. So getting someone like that, I have someone similar on my list as well, but Perry, I'm going to throw it over to you first. This is the first year I don't have one that I'm like banging on the table for. Um, I think maybe I've just been burned too many times that I'm (laughs) trying not to get emotionally attached to anyone. Like there are plenty of like really fun guys in this draft that I'm excited to see how their careers unfold. Yeah. Um, my closest, I have one on each side of the ball, but mm-hmm. I mean, my closest was Cameron Kitchens. Um, and then he tested really, really, really bad. Poorly. <laughs> and I was like, completely never, off of the Packers radar. <laughs> never going to end it, up in Green Bay, but he's just, I think going to be a really awesome football player somewhere. It's just not going to be in Green Bay because his relative athletic score was nowhere even it was like a two lower. something wasn't it <laughs> it's, yeah. it's he tested yeah. better at his pro day than he did at the combine um but like in the fours so like not that much better um but just like a really awesome ball player just like a really freaking fun ball player and like the kind of safety that i think would pair like so fun with um with a xavier mckinney but I digress. Um, my, I've never had a running back as a draft crush either. Dusty. Um, I usually actually don't have draft crushes on the offensive side of the ball, but I love Blake Corum. Um, also a player that's not going to end up in green Bay because he's pretty much exactly what the Packers already have in their running back room. But I think I love him more so because of like the human being side of things. Like if you listen to any interviews, 
with him, he just is like a really, really easy guy to root for. Um, so again, just like more of like, I'm excited to see the way his career unfolds. And I think he's going to bring just a, be a really lovely person in any locker room. Um, so I love the human side of the draft, like watching all these guys, like dreams literally come true before your eyes. It's just so wonderful. But um, no one that I'm actually super attached to this year. We are so similar in a variety of different ways. So first of all, Cam Kinchin's uh, right now in uh, RAS database still listed as a 2.43. So like, I just, I, I want to know who in the draft room has the job of just like taking the walk over to the board and just taking the name and just like throwing it in the garbage can of like, well, that's not going to be our guy. Um, but yeah, not, not going to be a Green Bay Packer in all likelihood. Uh, it's so funny though, that the first thing you mentioned, Perry, is that like you don't have your one a sort of complete draft crush i'm in a very similar spot there's a lot of guys that i really like but if you think about it from like uh who will the packers take who's realistic what positions they need there's two wide receivers lad mcconkey and ricky persol that i absolutely love in this draft i know neither of them are going to be packers because they're just not in all likelihood going to go wide receiver that early jackson powers johnson is so freaking fun to watch the odds that Green Bay just goes flat up center that does basically nothing else and is just a center. It's not impossible. They drafted Josh Myers in the second round. So I guess it's theoretically within the realm, but I don't know that they go in that direction. And then the other thing that we have in common here is I also had a running back that was on my list, although a different running back, which is sort of surprising because this isn't a super strong running back draft, but I watched a lot of Trey Benson lately. I know he's had some injury issues in the past, but again, we're talking about a player who was used in a rotation, does not have a ton of wear and tear on his body. Uh, I would like to see him be a little bit more of a, a dynamic playmaker, you know, coming out of the backfield as a pass receiver, similar to what you talked about, Dusty. But you talk about a guy who can take it the the, the distance on any given you know play. I think he had three runs of 80 plus yards. I, I, that's what I'm sort of looking for is that change of pace. And we saw how important that that was for Green Bay when Aaron Jones was out and they didn't have that playmaking ability. And I still think, as, as you mentioned, Dusty, with Jones, he, he wasn't even like he was ever going to be the guy that necessarily took it 80 into the house. Having that dynamic skill player that you can grind away with Jacobs for a while, and then all of a sudden, bam, you've got a, a Benson or one of these three guys that we talked about coming in and having that ability, that would be such a fun change up to have for this offense. Sweet. Yeah. All right, let's go to number two. We talked about our best case scenario or sort of our draft crush. We also have to talk about what's our worst case scenario. So Perry, I will let you start and it could be a position. It could be a player that you're just like, please, no, I don't want this. Uh, is there a worst case scenario where uh, the Packers could take a player in round one and you just be like, mm, not happy? Not really. Um, I, I think the Packers are in actually a pretty good spot right now. Um, like the team feels like there are obvious holes, right? There are obvious holes that need to be plugged. And I think we're going to get into those in our, in our rundown here. Um, I think, you know, they don't need to take a quarterback around one. I think that's probably <laughs> like worst case scenario. Maybe Fair. Um, You know, they're about to pay one. I don't think, but like, other than that, I, I, there are a few positions that I'd maybe be like, okay, that that's an abundance of riches. Um, but I could, I could make the case for why they would add to that skill group in round one. I understand where the Packers value certain positions, even if maybe it's not a immediate need. I just think the way that they draft and, um, you know, put their roster together, I, I can see them doing, they always do something that people are like, head scratch it. And then it makes sense, you know? in the future because they future build. They don't, it's what they're supposed to do. They're not taking for immediate need right now. They're taking best player available and it may look not the best in the moment, i.e. 2020 draft. <laughs> and then all of a sudden you get to 2024 and it, it makes perfect sense. So I don't know really. Um, I mean, I don't know if I'd want a running back in round one, I guess that's, that's, or like, the safety it's not a great safety class and maybe yeah. if it's a need and I feel like they're reaching and it's not good value I think maybe that would be worst case scenario is that um, they have so many picks and I feel like if they move up for a player and they're reaching too high um, and it's not good value that might be my worst case scenario but I find it hard to believe that Goot would do something like that well said I've been a very similar boat but Dusty I'll let you go next 
Yeah, mine is just I, I, I'm not gonna do a player. The last time I did a player was it was 2020 draft, and I said, well, they shouldn't take Jordan Love in the first round. They shouldn't do that. And then, <laughs> no, then say somebody. Then say somebody because it'll be another amazing draft pick. So please do so. Yeah, did you really say that? I, it's in writing somewhere. It's at Cheesehead TV. They had us do it every year, so it's somewhere at Cheesehead TV. I'll see. I did it for it. Rashawn Gary. So I did. did I, I did it for Rashawn Gary, and was like when he got picked, I'm like, no. <laughs> and I was super upset and went on Cheesehead TV and was not happy. So uh, we've all been there. We've all, yeah, all been there. I'll see if I can dig it up. I think for me, and not even thinking necessarily first round, but like if they don't come out of this draft with a dude from like day one that can at least push Sean Ryan at right guard, I'll feel pretty. That, that, like, the thing, I don't, you, there's not a move here you can do that's going to like screw up the team. I, said, I think like worst case scenario, like nothing's going to implode. Yeah. But the line, there's, I think there's, you need more depth on the line, which I think we'll get into. A little bit down the line here anyway, but that's the obvious as starters, preferred five starters. The weak link is right guard. Like, I don't think that's that's a particularly hot take to say. That's the weak link. They need someone from day one that can go in there and just go, all right, if I'm not the day one starter, I'm pushing you real hard. In my midseason, I should be able to take this job. Like, they need to come out of this draft with someone that can do that. If not, like, that feels that feels like that's probably not good if they if that does not happen. Yeah, that makes a ton of sense as well. Perry, we're, we're fairly in lockstep here. The, the big thing, I would hate to see if they like used a lot of those picks to move up in the first round for a player aggressively. I don't believe that this is a super high-end draft, meaning I think those, those first three wide receivers are unbelievably dynamic, but Green Bay doesn't need to spend a draft pick plus other draft picks to move up to get a wide receiver. There's no need. I think the quarterbacks are going to be really interesting. Obviously, Green Bay is not going to be interested in that. I like a lot of the offensive tackles. You're not going all the way up to get alt in the top eight ish. That's not going to happen. And then I think you sort of get to a realm around pick 15, where I think they would start to move up potentially. That isn't all that different from what they would potentially get at pick 25. I think there's a couple exceptions. If they really love a Quinion Mitchell or a Terry and Arnold or one of these corners, I could understand the thought process there. And hopefully they don't have to give up too much to get it. But I think going up super aggressively and trying to get a player that is probably not going to be that much better than what they could do at 25 while also giving up a second and a third or two thirds or whatever it might be. I think that would be one of my biggest uh, you know, issues or, or worst case scenarios. I'm with, I'm with you, Perry. Just if I, I, we know Green Bay could get to pick 25 and pick somebody and be like, wow, did not see that coming. Green Bay has certainly done that on numerous occasions. I think, and we're, we all should give Goots and the Packers the benefit of the doubt if they do something like that, but they're in a pretty good position where it feels like they don't have to reach at that point. And if they're going to shock and be like, we're going to take Kingsley Suamata'ea, well, can you get back to like 33 and pick up a third round pick before you do something super shocking rather than maybe taking that aggressive pick at 25? So I think just the, the value going up too high, you know, not going down and taking that shocker. And if we want to name... I think at 25, a player like Jordan Morgan, who could make a lot of sense for Green Bay in round two, he's not my particular cup of tea. I think he's going to take quite a bit of time to develop. Taking him at 25, that that type of player at 25 would probably be a little bit over aggressive for me. So those would be some of the scenarios that are at the top of my head. Yeah, I just think like the way the, I mean, this is such a cop out response, but I just like genuinely feel like the way the board unfolds over the course of the first round will also be like such an indication of what the Packers will do. Because if there's a run, like you said, Andy on quarterbacks and then on wide receivers, and then, you know, potentially even tackles, even though I feel like that could be something the Packers do in the first round. Although like they, oh, I can't even remember the last time they did take someone that. Derek Sherrod. Yeah. Um, yeah. It, it wouldn't, it still wouldn't surprise me if they were like, well, there's look at all these great corners that are falling yep. down to us, you know, even maybe like one of the, they've had a few like D linemen come in for their top 30 visits. Like a guy is falling to 25 there, or, you know, with again, abundance of riches, like maybe they like one of the edges that's like towards the end of the first round. I just think they're kind of actually like again, in a good position from a roster building standpoint where they don't need to reach that it would surprise me a lot if they did, especially because I think what's going to go early is not what they need at all. So it's just going to push some players down towards them. 
Totally agreed. Uh, without putting words into your mouth, Dusty Evely, uh, I think you may have spoiled your most recent one a little bit, or the, the answer to this one uh, with your most recent answer, but what is the Packers' biggest need going into this draft? It's different than the thing I just said because I don't plan what I say out, Andy. Uh, <laughs> uh, safety. It's got to be safety for me. Love like it. just because the way this has to work. Like it's not even like a – like a, you got the depth thing, right? Like you need – depth at safety, but you also see another starter. Like, yeah, if they go in with whatever, like I think Anthony Johnson Jr. has showed enough flashes to where if they go in and go, he's our box guy that can fade back occasionally with McKinney. That maybe isn't the end of the world, but you need a guy like you need to build that spine of the defense. I think the defensive line, I kind of like where that's at linebacker, <laughs> but safety, you safety, you need, like you need, you need another dude to play the way Halfley wants to play to do the different things they're going to want to do. And I don't, again, unless Anthony Johnson Jr. is the guy, like, I don't think, I don't think you have it there. And even if he is, you need depth behind it. So I think safety based on how they want to play this defense and the fact that it is like this brand new thing you're bringing in, you've got the four, three, it's a different way to play. Like this is your chance to really kind of set the tone. You got McKinney, you need the other guy in here. Who's that guy? I've spent entirely too much time looking at half his defense in the off season. And that's the one thing I keep going, well, they're going to bring a guy in, right? Like they're going to, and they, they haven't. So I think they've got someone in mind. I think they've got something in mind, but they need that primary box safety. Like that seems to me, if they walk out of the draft without someone that can do that, that's a like, okay, what's the, what's the plan here? What yeah. you could have brought someone with free agency earlier. You didn't, you know, you, this is a hole. So the, to me, that's the absolute biggest need. Really hoping that a name like Jaden Hicks is a player that could be that. Oh I think he's gosh, just a perfect yeah. box safety uh, and fits perfectly in Halfley's system. If it, if this was like Joe Barry's system, I don't know that I'd be quite as high on Hicks, although I still like him. But it, being that box safety next to Xavier McKinney, like, I, sign me the hell oh, up. Oh, yeah, he'd be great. Oh, absolutely. Harry Goldstein, biggest need. Packs what she said, loves Jaden Hicks. Um <laughs> I mean, safety is the answer for me as well, but in order to be a little bit different, I'm definitely inside linebackers making me really nervous going into this season. Like, yeah. don't get me wrong, I'm really high on Quay, but Quay has still a lot of developing to do. Um, and then you have Isaiah McDuffie and then a bunch of special teamers. Like, you're one injury away. Very similar to safety, quite frankly, but... They just like made that big splash at safety to feel a little bit better about it. But like you're one injury away from linebacker being a huge, 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 huge problem. Like they did not address it in free agency at all. They have to do something about it. And again, I don't know like how Halfley is going to play this in terms of like it's going to look very different from from the way it's been. Um, but I don't love the way that room looks. And especially I think like, again, very high on Quay. I think he has a lot of the skills. I mean, he's going to wear the dot. Obviously he's going to be the guy, but he's not great in coverage. And he, you know, and like they were already rotating Isaiah McDuffie in with Devondre Campbell. Is Isaiah McDuffie going to play more now? I don't know how much I love the idea. He's not an every down linebacker either. So it's just, it's just a big, big, big question mark to me. And I also think it's just something you can address in later rounds. It's not something that I think they're going to do in the first round. They can leave this draft day two, day three with somebody. You just need to leave this draft with somebody. Well said. And those both of those positions, as, as Dusty was kind of alluding to, and you mentioned it too, Perry, it's, it's not just that you need somebody at the forefront to compete for those spots. It's that you're just barren and in depth and really a, a play or two away from being completely in a really, really bad spot at either of those positions. That being said, and people uh, on the podcast are probably already going to know what my answer is here, but for me, it's still offensive line. And you're going to invest $55 million a year into a quarterback. You have all the weapons in the world. We know that this offense can be really good if you just protect that dude. And right now, I as Dusty, you mentioned earlier, I have some Sean Ryan concerns. I have still Josh Myers concerns. It seems I don't have really Rasheed Walker concerns, but it seems like the Packers have some Rasheed Walker concerns because they kind of keep bringing that up. And then you just get to next man up is next man up right now is probably Royce Newman, which should give everyone enough cause for concern. You've got Luke Tenuta, Caleb Jones, and then Kadeem Telford. Those are the only backups that you have on the roster right now. I, to me, you only have five guys that are locks to make this roster. I don't think Newman, Telford, uh, Tenuta, or Caleb Jones are locks to make the roster. And 
you, to me, you like need to have competition at the forefront. You need to have a lot more depth and bodies that can go in in case of emergency. And like I said, protect your franchise quarterback. And we saw Jordan Love take all of those beautiful steps as a passer and a thrower, keeping his eyes downfield. The last thing you want is all of a sudden he gets into the habit of having to drop those eyes because you've got a Byron Bell situation and it's just a turnstile up front. Oh so, um, yeah, I, I, that's that's still where I lean. This is a points league. you got to be able to put up points. We know defense is obviously still important. I'm going to trust Jeff Halfley to figure out a way to figure out the other stuff in a worst case scenario based on absolutely nothing. But I want that number 10 protected at all costs. And of course, that's going to help all your receivers, tight ends, Josh Jacobs, everything as well. Just a force multiplier all the way around. Yeah. I, I feel like I'm less worried about offensive line because I just know the Packers are going to do it in the draft. It's like where yeah. they always address offensive line, you know, like the other ones I'm like, like they let, I mean, what was it? Two seasons ago? We we're like, all right, they're gonna, they're going to take a safety in this. Like they have to take a safety in this draft. Right. And then they didn't, you know? Yeah. So I, I feel less like I agree with you that it's probably actually the biggest need. Um, in terms of like overall needs on this team for all the reasons that you mentioned, I guess I just feel less concerned about it because I just know for a fact, they're going to leave this draft with at least two offensive linemen. Yeah. We'll go over that. I have something on that in a little bit as well. Also Dane Brugler in his top 100 uh, draft prospects for this uh, draft, 22 of them are offensive linemen of the top 100. So hopefully uh, Green Bay is going to be able to address that pretty aggressively. And of course, Green Bay has five picks in the top 100. It is a big need. So to your point, Perry, it's going to get addressed, I think, in a very major way. Uh, this was a little bit more interesting. And if, if we don't have great answers here, that's okay. But this is kind of the fun conversation portion of it. Is there a sneaky draft need for the Green Bay Packers? Um, I'll start this time. Uh, and then you guys can chime in after if you have something. I actually had defensive line down on my list in like interior defensive line. I'm actually going to go edge rusher is going to be my answer here. And the reason being is of course we love Rashawn. And I think if you look at the the need right now for this team, you've got Rashawn, you've got Preston, you've got Enigbari coming back from ACL at some point, you've got uh, uh, LVN, you've got uh, even a Bretton Cox. It's, it doesn't scream as this huge need. At some point, you're going to need to get off this Preston Smith contract and start going in a different direction. This isn't going to last forever. Inigbari is a really nice player, but he's coming off an ACL, and it's not like he's popped off the page of like, yes, this has future potential starter listed all over him or anything like that. You're not making any decisions on Bretton Cox. Like You can make an argument that going into 2025, it's Rashawn Gary and LVN as your top two, and then probably Inigbari as your number three kind of after that. And one, you can never have enough pass rushers. And two, uh, you as much as we want LVN to be this huge next breakout guy, he still has development to do. And there's not necessarily a guarantee that that just happens. And meanwhile, we love Rashawn, but he has had ACL injury already. And, you know, towards the second half of last year is worn down a little bit. It is really in a fine to good to even really good spot right now. I'm not saying it's a need today, but if we know Green Bay drafts a year in advance. Um, I'm kind of looking at 2025 and saying, you know what, if you took a, another pass rusher early, I would not have any, any real issues with it. I actually, I had that written down. That was mine initially was edge. Like that does make a lot of sense. Mine is actually, I'm going tight end. Um, Interesting. because you've got, you've got your two, right? You got Musgrave, you got Kraft, but then behind that Tyler Davis, Ben Sims, Joel Wilson, like all of whom are like, I guess all of whom I don't know anything about Joe Wilson, Tyler Davis and Ben Sims are largely fine. Like they, they, you know what their role is. They can be largely fine, but as good as Musgrave and Kraft look this past year, Musgrave obviously had injury concerns in college. Yeah. Uh, he, he was injured last year. Uh, we don't know like, you know, if that's going to creep up again or if that's kind of a one-off thing or whatever. Kraft looked like a dog by the end of the year. So you've got these two guys, one with injury concerns. They both kind of serve a role. If one of those guys gets injured, you're suddenly like, same thing they did with Musgrave got injured. All right, Ben Sims is in. And they did some fine things with Ben Sims when he was in there. But it's this seems like a this seems like a perfect opportunity to grab a developmental tight end and stash him a little bit. Someone with traits, like someone like Theo Johnson or something, that's just like, this guy's traits, he needs to develop. We'll throw him on teams. He's our three, he's our four. He comes in if someone gets injured, but then two years down the line, like he, he could be a really good piece for us. So I, again, I like, I think those top two guys are fine. I just think you look anywhere past that. And it's, I mean, you were, you're a Luke Musgrave injury away from Tucker Kraft having to start having to play like 90% of snaps or, 
a little more Tyler Davis coming off whatever the ACL, right? Was Tyler Davis and Ben Sims. And I don't with this, with this, I think what they want to do with the tight ends in this offense. I don't, I don't love the thought of that. I, cause I'm a huge I like nerd. That one. I uh, went back and watched all the players that like nobody knows about on the Packers roster. Um, and I ranked them from one See, to 12. Uh, yeah. Where's Joe Wilson? Where's Joe he Wilson was number four on my list of the, the of the 12. So <laughs> it wasn't terrible. He, he okay. had a 4.33 relative athletic score, 23 years old out of central Michigan. This is exactly where I want this podcast to go, by the way. Joel Wilson, <laughs> right down. Score 242, played some special teams. Uh, so yeah, like I actually, he had a little bit of run after the catch. He had a couple of really spectacular catches as well. So he's not going to make the team. He might be a practice squad guy, but he was my fourth of all the like players you've never heard of on the team. He was fourth out of 12. So I'm ashamed I didn't know him then. I'm, I'm so ashamed. <laughs> Thank you. Appreciate that. You're welcome. Justin, you're not spending your free time watching practice squad tight end. I know. I know. Can you believe it? Shame. Oh, it's oh. shame. I know, man. What, I'm so lame. I'm so yeah. You're you're all, both of your pack a day podcast status is up in the air after this conversation. But uh, Perry, you're up next. Um, yeah, Edge was number one for me. Also, I I think it just again, it's just like it looks good right now, and then all of a sudden, you know, you 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 realize Preston Smith is probably on it at the end of his tenure, and you don't really know where the LVN development is going, and then you're like. And also, like, again, there are just premium positions where it's just, like, you always want to fill those rooms, right? You always want to keep, like, okay, get another guy in there. Like, keep pressuring the quarterback. Like, there, it's just one of those places where I'm never going to be, to your point, Andy, if they take one early, great. I'm never going to be upset about that, which is why mine is corner. Um, I just think yeah. it's just always fill that room. Always, 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 always fill that room. Um we watched as their first round pick, unfortunately missed like a season and a half, right? You just never know what's going to happen. We still have no idea what Eric's, I mean, you hope Eric Stokes comes back and is a starter again, but like you genuinely have no idea. And yes, they brought Nixon back, but I'm not sure if Nixon is like, they paid him this way, but like, is Nixon the future of their slot? I don't know. And I, I, you know, you like to think that with more snaps, they seem to say like with more time towards the end of the season, he was really coming on to that position, et cetera. It's a very hard position to play in the NFL, but like fill that room, right? Jair didn't play a full season. Carrington Valentine needs to take another step. Like, again, you're just like one injury away, maybe from like not feeling so great. Um, so I will always always root for them taking like if they take a corner in the first round this year i will not be surprised but at by any stretch of the imagination um and i also i think would support it because it's just mm -hmm. like a blue chip position you you want to fill a room with um so i think corner i would also throw in there i don't know what you guys think about this but running back for sure yeah. um running back a hundred percent because like aj dylan is back and i think people are just like oh number two but he's not like really back like so AJ Dillon can, might not make the roster. On him. Yeah. yeah and also he's a little redundant with josh jacobs i think if anything like josh jacobs is a more well-rounded back yeah, than he does AJ everything dylan. he does everything a little worse than josh jacobs basically right if any i would say only thing is his pass pro is probably better than josh jacobs and that's oh, like man. a and he catches more passes, but also maybe just Josh Jacobs wasn't asked to catch passes in the Raiders offense. And like, we just don't know um, what that looks like for him. But I think that like, there's a huge hole missing with the Aaron Jones departure in terms of like type of running back, which you guys have already alluded to on the show. Um, and like, they like Emmanuel Wilson, but you know, it's just like fill, fill that room and you can do that again. And like, fourth fifth sixth round you don't need to do it early um but yeah there's there's a there's a player type in that room that's missing mm -hmm. matt lafleur certainly seems very excited about getting josh jacobs more involved in the passing game so i'm very much looking forward to seeing that uh but yeah behind him there definitely can be some improvement opportunities do you think if uh Dylan gets released and they bring in a rookie. It's like, he have to hand over the key to the door County or to the, the new, like, this is yours. Like you, there's like this ceremony of like passing on. I kid, I kid. He'll always be the mayor of door County. No, no question about it. Uh, all right. We went over like 
the sneaky draft need. Is there a need that you're hearing about or just a little buzz here and there that you're like, this is ridiculous. This is overblown. They don't actually need to do that much at the position. Um, again, there might not be, but, uh, and this was a little bit of a tougher one for me, but, um, if you want me to go first, I'm happy to. Otherwise, if one of you have one, feel free to take the floor. I, mean, I, I think, actually, oh, oh, go, go ahead. Go no, no, no. Yeah, have at it. Um, Andy put out a video this week that I disagree with. Ooh, Ooh I like this. Oh, from- I, I don't think the Packers needed, look, again, abundance of riches. If they want to go for it, go for it. But I actually think this is the first time ever going to season where I'm like, this defensive line room is set. Like they, if they don't take a defensive lineman, I think it's fine. Um, I think they're stacked from starter to depth. And look, I know Andy, your point was like, you're looking for the future, right? And there's some contracts coming up that like are up in the air. Um, And yes, we know the Packers like look towards the future. So like that could be something they do in this draft, but like, I do not think it's a need for the first time in years. Yeah. I mean, to, to be clear, like you said, 2025 is what I'm looking at when Clark and Slayton are free agents. And with Clark and, and Slayton being free agents, that that bigger run-stopping defensive tackle gets very barren very quick because you'll get Colby Wooden, not that. Carl Brooks, not that. Devontae Wyatt, not that. And also next year, you've got a fifth-year option on Devontae Wyatt already, which becomes a very interesting conversation point. Now, to your, to your other point, going into this season, Kenny Clark, TJ Slayton, Devontae Wyatt, Colby Wooden, Carl Brooks, LVN can kick inside a little bit. You've still got an interesting back of the roster sort of guy in Jonathan Ford. So I, yeah, I'm I'm totally fine with it where it's at right now, but it's it's more of that that big nose tackle position or just a, a, a run stopper that I think if you start looking for that guy now, the issue is it's not there's not really that guy in that this draft unless you're going with 366 pound Tavondre Sweat. Um, there's not a ton of those guys in this draft either. So it's, it's, it's a tough conversation to have one way or the other, but I'm with you this season. I definitely feel comfortable with that position. My, mine was, I, my mind kind of, I don't have one. Cause I was trying to think through like what I've seen in terms of what our draft needs. And the main ones I came up with were cornerback linebacker and offensive line. I'm like, well, they need all of those Perry to your point. I've seen some, I think justice has argued. They don't really need corner. They need corner, man. Like uh, Jair has been, injured stokes has been like more extremely injured not just injured but like super injured uh basically uh valentine i really liked i liked him at kyle liked him at uk but we don't know what that looks like Mm -hmm. nixon you talked about valentine like just seems like a dude to me like you need something there linebacker for all the reasons we talked about offensive line for all the things so i was trying to think of okay what's what's something overblown what are people really getting too crazy about and everything i was looking at like now that could they could use dudes there. And for the most part, some of those, like the starters are fine. Cornerback, that room looks dynamite if healthy. I just, you can't bank on anyone there being healthy at this point. No, that makes all the sense. I, I agree with everything you said. I'm going to sort of spoil this from the next question and sort of parlay it into the next one, because the next question that I wanted to ask you guys is, and this, this, this buzz around this question is, do the Packers need Christian Watson insurance in this draft? And the conversation point has been around, like, if Watson goes down again and continues to have all the injury issues that he's had, uh, do you need somebody that can stretch the field like a Christian Watson? Along with that, there's always the question of, do the Packers need a one a number one wide receiver? Do they need a number one wide receiver? Do they need? That's where I. That's my my answer to the next question of do they need a Christian Watson insurance? My answer is no. And my most overblown need or like any sort of conversation point is exactly that. I don't think they need an alpha number one wide receiver that's going to try to supplant anyone that's already on the roster. I love the depth. I love the playmakers. I love how Matt LaFleur uses all these guys. I love how any different wide receiver could step up any given week. And no, I don't think that they need a Christian Watson insurance. There are guys that can stretch the field. We saw Jaden Reed be a playmaker. We saw Bo Melton be a playmaker. Dobbs was a huge playmaker in the playoffs. I'm I'm very, very fine. Even if Watson goes down for six, seven games again, they have enough guys in that room that can make plays. So that's my answer. But if any of you, dis- Perry, you want to disagree with me again for the second time? Yeah, do it. Oh, get him, Perry. No, I actually, wide receiver was going to be my next uh, choice. It's just like, people just love talking about wide receivers in the draft, which like, obviously, because they're fun. Yeah. Um, and like, if the Packers want to go ahead and take a wide receiver in this draft, sure, go yep. for it. Um, but I'm not looking at it in terms of like, oh, it's because it's Christian Watson insurance. Like, it's just because like, yeah, keep adding playmakers to an already really young, fun, dynamic offense. Like, keep adding playmakers for Jordan Love. You know, I look at it like my comparison is always, you know, the Packers won the Super Bowl. And then the next thing they did was take Randall Cobb. 
right? For yeah. for Aaron Rodgers. And it's just like, yeah, of course, you're always going to add to that room. But I I am not on like the Christian Watson fear train by any stretch of the imagination. Well, to your point too, Andy, I mean, if this was three years ago, it's a different conversation because that was, I remember looking at that, that was when MVS was injured, when he was not there, Packers were scoring five fewer points per game in games that he missed just yeah. because they had no speed. Like I think Geronimo Allison was like their number two or something. I might be, I might oh. be missing my years here, uh, but they just didn't have speed. They had like Lazard there. Who's not fast. You had Devante whose speed was not his thing. Now you've got, I mean, that, that was always thing for a year, put speed in the wide receiver room and they had one dude that could do it. Now it's, I mean, you mentioned those guys, even Wicks has like got, yep. got a little gear to him. Like he's not fast, fast. He's let's say he's not Christian Watson fast. Like very few people who have ever played the game are as fast as Christian Watson is. So yep. you can't replace that speed. Like you said, what you've got Dobbs who is not, I don't think as fast as 40 time. So he's kind of more the middle guy, but yep. Reed Wicks Melton, um, they had Toure out there to just like run fast that way. And that's all they asked him to do. <laughs> yeah. Like you've got functional speed here that you didn't have three years ago. And so Watson is a difference maker in this team, but yeah, they could, I think they can bolster the wide receiver room, but it's not like, Oh, he's down. We don't have anyone to stretch the field. Everyone can stretch the field now. Like everyone I'm looking at it now, everyone except like Malik Heath, right. Is like, it, they can run fast at the very least. Those guys can run fast. That's something they didn't have. Even three years ago, like 2019, they didn't have that. So it's been yeah. 2020, they didn't have that. So it's, it's it's nice to have kind of speed besides one man uh, back there. Not and to even, mention. Oh, but, sorry. No, no I was going to say, I mean, you, you can just watch this past season. And like, yes, when Christian Watson plays, I think there's a dynamic to this Packers offense that is just very different. And it, it's really hard not to notice it, right? Like, like that Kansas City he, game. When he did that Kansas City yeah, game, I mean, just, yeah. And even when he's not catching the ball, I mean, the way he just draws defenders is is so unique. But it's not like they were losing games when he wasn't in because they have enough playmakers to the point where somebody new steps up in whenever there's somebody that goes down. Like they were missing other wide receivers at certain points too. It wasn't like he was the only one that was injured and somebody new steps up. So this offense is... And I, and I keep saying this whenever we talk about this offense because I'm just so curious to see how it goes over the next few years, not just with the Packers, but just offenses in general, just this like wide receiver one conversation. It's like, do you need a wide receiver one? Are NFL offenses like evolving past the need for that? Is my just like, I don't know, existential football question. Um, because just also like the way they're getting paid and the fact that like all these guys coming out of college, like that we're going to watch get drafted. They're all so ready, you know, like there's all of these like fun dynamic guys that are ready. You don't need like this one guy on your team. You can have all these like super fun playmakers without a one, you can spread the ball around. Like we watched the Packers do this past season and it keeps defenses on their toes, you know, and offenses evolve and defenses catch up. And like, that's kind of how this game goes over time and like maybe that's what we're watching right now which is like this non-need for a one anymore um i don't think the packers need one and i think it's actually to their advantage that they don't have one it was frustrating to watch a one get fed the ball all the time when there were other guys who were obviously open you know take the read take the open when it's there so that's my spiel about it it's no, very I, off topic. i'm sorry no, to your point though, what the, why people want a number one is those you know go to situations. It's third and fourteen, game on the line. You got to convert a first down. You, what you need is somebody that you know is going to get open in that situation. It doesn't have to be Devonte Adams, you know, going up against their number one corner and having a safety over the top in that situation. It can be Dontavian Wicks versus a number three corner that can't stick with Dontavian Wicks. It can be Jaden Reed against a slot corner that can't stick with Jaden Reed. It can be a linebacker trying to travel with Luke Musgrave up the seam. It could be an undersized corner trying to get it going against Romeo Dobbs in a physical situation where Dobbs can just go out muscle him for it. It can be Christian Watson running past a number one corner if he gets the right matchup. It, it does, and that's where Lafleur comes in and is yeah. so magical with what he can do is. He knows where the mismatch is. And if you've got five different, five, six, seven different mismatch pieces that you can go to in any given moment, and the defense doesn't know what you're going to be thinking in that moment, unlike if you have that one A guy that you're probably staring down and being like, we're going to get him the ball somehow. 
that I'm more for that because they have those mismatches because not many teams have a defensive backfield who can stick with all of those options that we just talked about. So that's why I was going to mention earlier, uh, not only that the wide receiver, do you have those options, but having a Luke Musgrave that can scream up the seam. We want to talk about gravity. He has some of that gravity to him as well. He needs to stay on his feet when he gets the ball in his hands, but um, yeah, <laughs> that, that's another I think also, I mean, not many offenses, like you can, try to plan to have this many playmakers, right? I'm sure many offenses try, but the fact that the Packers have hit on the amount of wide receivers and tight ends to your point, Andy, that they did is just like quite, I mean, not luck. It's obviously like take skill and scouting and developing, et cetera. But like, there's some level of like magic <laughs> to it. It just does. It just doesn't, it doesn't happen. Obviously we have to see like a jump to it, but like there's going to be a need to capitalize on it as well as like kind of figure out going into the season, like what do we do with this amount of people? I mean, there's like five roster lock wide receivers going into camp. And if they take one in this draft, you know, is that like, depending on where that guy is, and this is just speculation, is it early? Is it late? Is it a practice squad guy? Is it someone that Goot and team, really love who happens to just be there at good value. And then that's six wide receivers who's, who are going to make the team. Like there's a lot of, it's, it's a good problem to have, but it's, it's not a common problem to have. If there is one disappointing aspect of hitting on all those wide receivers, it's the fact that this is a really freaking fun wide receiver draft class. And it's like, oh, I don't even know if they can take one, but there's like amazing ones all over the place. So that's the one, but to your point earlier, Perry, uh, if there's one that Goody likes and he's best available on the board and he wants to take him, he's going to take him, and that's totally fine. And they'll figure out the rest of the logistics on that later. All right, we're going to go speed around the rest of the time. Perry, you know me well enough to know I'm going to ask this question uh, right around this time. Your bold prediction for the 2024 Packers NFL draft, because you had to expect it coming, Perry, I'm going to go with you first. Bold prediction for the draft. Oh, Andy, I don't have a bold prediction. Come really. on. Um, so they're going to trade up in the time. Say something saucy. I mean, they're definitely not leaving this draft with all their draft picks. There's going to be, I love this. there's, there, there's, there's going to be some packaging of picks and there's going to be moving around 100%. Um, is it back? Is it forward? Who's to say, but there's going to be trading for sure. All right. I'm going to double down on yours before I get to Dusty. I'm going to say that the Packers leave with more than 11 draft picks in this draft. They will have more than 11. I think they end up with like 12 or 13 picks in this draft. I'm also going to double down and say they end up with at least four offensive linemen from this draft. So now that I stole everything possible, Dusty, what is your bold prediction? <laughs> Packers trade up in the top 15. Uh, they, I, they, they never trade up in the first round. They're trading up in the first 15. Wow. And, for, and to for all, to all the points you said earlier, Andy, completely agree with. I think they're in a pretty nice spot. I don't think they. I think you can get good value where they are. Uh, but I think they're trading in the, in the top fifteen. This is. I was gonna game. say they get to the top ten and they go get Marvin Harrison Jr. But that's 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 too big even for me. So I'm not I'm not doing that. But I'll say they're going top fifteen. Interesting. I I have played with the. Uh, Terry and Arnold 15 to 16 range. If he, yes. if he gets past the Colts, this, that's the one I've been talking about where I think there's a chance that Arnold and Mitchell get to the Colts at 15. And then the Colts, I think take Mitchell just based on their usual preferences. They they're the only team that likes athletic players more than green Bay does. <laughs> um, I think they probably take Mitchell based off of that. And then that leaves Arnold at 16 and Arnold is in my opinion, the most one a Packer in this entire draft of makes so much sense, everything that they need, everything they want, everything they love. Uh, so if I think in Seattle's at 16, uh, where they've traded with Seattle in the past, Seattle loves moving down in the draft. It's a John Schneider one one He loves moving down and like the exact draft capital needed to move up to that spot is either green Bay's first and their second, second or green Bay's first and both of their thirds. And both of them are like exact matches to move up exactly to Seattle's spot. So I, I don't, I don't mind that one at all. Dusty Evely. All right. Thank you. Uh, Terry and Arnold would be the dream. That'd be awesome. The dream. Oh, look, Perry, you're getting uh, excited. You ready to get your heart broken? Oh, look at this. I see don't where this is it. going. Oh, Breaking news. Back so she says Perry Goldstein loves corners and would like them to take <laughs> one of the draft. Hot takes. Uh, all right. Uh, Zach Tom, to center or not to center? That is the question. Dusty, I'll start with you. Should they move him to center? Does it not matter? Do you not care? What are your thoughts on this? 
My gut says leave him. If he's a very good right tackle, I've got – you said you didn't have a lot of questions about Rashid Walker. I've got questions about Rashid Walker. I don't have questions about Zach Tom. I think if you've got a – what you like in a right tackle, if you've got a lockdown right tackle, which he basically was last year, I think you keep him there. Now, center, the only thing I'll say, if you think he's like a top three center in the league by moving him to center and you need improvement there and this tackle class is so good, you think we can replace right tackle, we'll just draft a guy, fine. Do it if that's if that's how highly you think of him at center, but he is so good as a right tackle. I hate the idea of like this guy's a really good right tackle. What if we moved him to center and we drafted someone? If we drafted someone, they might even be as good as someone like Zach Tom. Like that doesn't make any sense to me. So I'm in favor of right tackle, only move him to center if you've got a plan to replace him, and if you think he's like top three center, is is where I sit. BG. Yeah, I I don't know if I have much more to add to Dusty's point. I mean when you have a guy locking it down as well as Zach Tom did at a very important position, don't move him unless you have someone who's going to play as well, if not better. Yep. Well said. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, no, that's, 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 that's about it. <laughs> my, my quick take on this from yesterday that I said is uh, the beautiful thing about having players with versatility is you give yourself options. If uh, th- there's no even sense in really having this conversation right now, because if they go into a game tomorrow, Josh Myers is your center and Zach Tom's your right tackle. There's no other real options out there to make any sort of moves. If they go through the draft or find a trade or f- find some Rick Wagner end of the season, you know, signing in all of a sudden they've got a great right tackle and Josh Meyer sucks in camp and you need to make that move. Awesome. You've got, you've got Elton who can move a variety of different places. You've got Zach Tom who can move a right. Like it's a beautiful thing that you have versatility. You don't need to use it until you've got the options to use it right now. He's a great right tackle. If they have that opportunity to do it and they need to do it great, but I don't, until that comes until that, that moment happens, we can, we can save that conversation for another day. Cause right now he's the starting right tackle and there's no other option on the team to take that spot. So that's where I'm at with it. Last but not least, before I get you out of here, I know Dusty, you said they're trading up. I'm not going to get to talk to you two, at least from a podcast standpoint until the, you know, after the draft. So Perry, Dusty, I need a name. The Packers will select in the NFL draft. <laughs> whom, whom will they select? I'll let either of you go first. If any of you wants to jump in. I'll go, uh, man, I got two names here. I'm going Grant Barton. He he seems like a Packer. Man, the, he fills a need that they have. I think he he is solid from day one. I think you've got a decent growth path there. I don't know that he's ever going to be like incredible, but I think he's always going to be good. So I think Graham Barton, Graham Barton seems like the dude. I think that's the name that gets turned in. So you've got you got double, you know, predictions here. One that they'll move into the top 15 and one that they'll take Graham Barton. So you're here's the thing. The if you end. if you interrogate anything I've said against anything I've said 30 <laughs> seconds ago, you'll find it's nothing but contradictions. <laughs> <laughs> it's a beautiful thing. Perry, what about you? Oh man, I have no idea. I just there's no point in predicting it. Like they're gonna do something crazy. They're gonna take a player none of us know about, but I feel like they're probably going to do something that's going to piss off half the fan base and take like a Marius Mims. So. <laughs> I love a Marius Mims. I do I'm, too. I'm, I'm I don't know why that. it's so controversial. but Top, top uh, 30 visit. They love their top 30 visits. So yeah, you, they you, do. Never, you never know. I, I looked at the that. measurables on that dude, like his arms and hands. That's not human. There's that just dude no... is a giant. To me also with him, it's like, okay, I understand the knock is that he barely started. They took LVN, who also barely started. I don't think that's really... It's about projection. It's about where you are going to go, not what you've already done. And when you have a freak body type like that, just a rare specimen of a human being, and you have a track record like the Packers do of molding offensive linemen, get that guy in the building. That's how I feel about it. Every once in a while, there's the philosophy of just like, they don't make many human beings like that. And uh, Marius Mims is one of those where he's just like, I don't make many of those. And if you have the opportunity to get your hands on someone like that, you, you kind of sometimes just do it. You figure it out. And then if it fails, you're like, well, that's on the coaching staff. That's on us for He's not getting a dude staff. like this to work. Yeah. <laughs> so, you've got 10 more picks. You've got four more top 100 picks. So if you want to you know, gamble a little bit more in the first round, you have a little bit of opportunity to do so. Hope you hit the home run. And uh, if not, you're still going to get a lot of really good prospects, hopefully in those next few rounds. I have 
like a thousand more episodes to do between now and the draft. So I can't give away my official uh, take yet. I will just say my official take as of right now is that they will move down from pick 25. That'll be my official take as of right now. I will make my official prediction probably the day of the draft. Like I said, I've, I've, I've got to keep people hanging on a little bit here and tuning in uh, day by day. But I'll just say that I think they move down at this point. Perry, Dusty, besides my cop-out answer at the end, uh, any final thoughts? Anything else you want to argue with me on, Perry? No, I just love when we disagree. It's so fun. It is more fun that way. We should just disagree for the sake of disagreeing. Okay. <laughs> Dusty, what about you? <laughs> Not nothing, man. This was a blast. Good. It's always good seeing you guys and talking to you guys. The last time we really got a chance to talk, we were we were on a rooftop bar in Green Bay. So this is uh, it's nice reconvening here with you guys. Always Always awesome to talk to you all. Very much so. We need to do that again very, very soon. So mm -hmm. make sure you're both booking plans to Green Bay sooner rather than later. Perry, amazing stuff. Where can we find all of your amazing work? Um, just follow me on Twitter at Perry underscore Goldstein. Follow the podcast that I do with Maggie Loney at Pax, which she said, PWSS podcast. We are going to have a fun special guest on the show this week. Uh, so tune in for that. We're going to be going through not ours because we don't do that, but they're our guests, big board. Um, so more draft content. Woo. That is amazing. Looking forward to that. Make sure to follow Pax, which she said they do amazing work. Uh, Dusty Evely, what would you like to plug on your way out here? Oh, you can find me on Twitter at Dusty Evely. I've got a series I'm running over at Cheese Head TV every week, every Wednesday. I need to get writing for this week where I'm going through a play per week from a play from a game this past season and trying to, as much as I possibly can, interrogate what the play call was. So it's getting, I'm learning a whole lot about uh, pass protections and stuff, which has been very interesting and fun and led to a lot of late nights. But that's been awesome. That's every Wednesday on Cheese Head that's been going on. That uh, the new um, thumbnail that you've put together for that I'm is so just excited about that. I'm so it's excited about so that. It's so gorgeous. I I like can't not click on it. I'm like whatever. I don't. You could put like I could open it up and it would just be a big fart noise, and I'm still clicking on it every single how, time. You know how I embed audio into, the, into those? <laughs> yeah, articles? I do. We can talk okay. after the pod. Right, I absolutely you. do know how to do that on Cheesehead TV <laughs> uh, from from uploading the podcast enough there. Uh, you guys are the absolute best. We should probably do this far more often. Make sure to follow the Packs for Cheesehead podcast, and of course Perry at Perry underscore Goldstein. Make sure to write, read all of Dusty's work, which is the best nerding out stuff on all the Packers sphere. So, and of course, at Des Dusty Evely on uh, X or Twitter, you can follow me at Andy Herman NFL. You can follow the podcast at Packaday Podcast. That's going to do it for us. But until next time, and as always, go Pack Go. Go Pack Go. Go Pack Go.